All right, thank you so much for uh, being with us at the 11th annual. So it's uh, you know beautiful Houston, but it could be a little bit war uh, colder, frankly, yeah. or cooler. It's, it's good seeing really, you again, Chadi. Yeah. So uh, you know, a lot. I mean, these meetings are so busy with so many things going on, and I just want to focus uh, on a couple of things pertaining to AML because I recall the days where we just use morphology and and and, and exactly. treat patients with that. Yeah, it's all changed. Um, all change not only this, I mean, the classifications have gotten too complex. So we'd like to simplify things on the hemang pulse. Um, so how do you, you know, how do we approach AML in 2023 just in understanding the different types of AML um, yeah. in a way that is helpful for the clinician in deciding therapy? Yeah, I, I think the most important part of all of this reclassification is to bring the biology closer to the treatment that we have. So the things that we should be focusing on as from a clinical standpoint are the markers that actually drive therapy, okay? Um, I think it's amazing how we are subclassifying acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoblastic leukemia by the various mutations, the fusion proteins that um, are being discovered that drive the disease and will become targets for novel therapies. And so it's a very exciting time. And you know, this all started with APL, right? This started with acute promyelocytic leukemia as the outlier, the most fatal form of leukemia. And we find the PML RAR fusion and is now the most curable with arsenic and um, trioxide and all transretinoic acid. And so I think from a clinical standpoint, it's wonderful to know the, you know, the classification. Do you have to know all of them? WHO? you know, the International Consensus Conference, the ELN risk stratification, or is it more important to really just focus for the clinician on what's important for them to know at the time of diagnosis and at the time of relapse? And I really think that's what the clinical people need to know. They need to know how to boil this down to what do I need to know to treat that patient in real time. So, you know, the clinician faces a patient with acute leukemia, they send the marrow, they send the peripheral blood, and the hematopathologist is going to send the report with the type of mutations that they, that they find. Yeah. And I think there's probably two possibilities. One, they find nothing, right? Pretty unusual, but okay. Um, I mean, I mean by nothing, like nothing, nothing to target. Nothing to target, yes. Yeah, okay, no, that's very, uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. that's too common. Yeah, uh, and things, something targetable. So how do we, something targetable, Right. What do you do? Okay, well, the first thing to do is don't panic, right? So wait for that information. I mean, we, can, we have learned that um, in either older or younger patients, you can wait for that information. Now, that's, I'm not saying send the patient home, you know, let them stew in their leukemia during that time. I'm talking about watching them closely, giving transfusion support for patients with, you know, pan, um, uh, pancytopenia. And patients with a high white count, give them hydroxyurea. You can control the disease as you wait for, as you wait for this. And it's so important because some of the interventions make a difference right, right away. And you need to, com we're combining new agents with seven and three. We're combining agents with hypomethylating agents with or without venetoclax, with other drugs that target the disease specifically. So it's important to wait for that information. What we have to convince doctors of is is it worth waiting because we still get the notion out there that everyone should be treated the same what's usually seven days yeah up to seven days okay. you could you could you know because usually you get within seven days hopefully you yeah you get it within seven days and and you know the, the pushback you get is oh the patient's sitting in the hospital i got to do something well remember the patient got put in the hospital because they showed up to an emergency room with a fever and it goes away with antibiotics or they needed a transfusion you don't have to keep them there that was your um, DRG for the ori original admission. And then you wait for that and send them home. Wait for the data. And then if you have to readmit them, then that's a different DRG payment. Or you could treat some of these patients as an outpatient. Um, so I really do think it's worth waiting. You just have to slow down a little bit, make sure the patient is safe, of course, but wait for the data because there are combinations of therapies that are going to be very important. And we're also learning that the mutations may may not direct a specific targeted um, uh, agent, but may imply or be correlated with a very high rate of response. So I'm talking about NPM1, okay? Very common, 50% of normal karyotype AML has an NPM1 mutation. We're all excited about the menin inhibitors. 
that are coming. But if you have an older patient with an um, uh, NPM1 mutation, think that that's a more favorable risk group of patients and treat them aggressively. But if you can't, Azaven has a very high response rate and that's a, a subset of patients that do very well for a long time. So not specifically targeted, but a favorable group of patients that should help you with your treatment decision making. We mentioned a lot of these mutations yeah. and things like that. Can, for viewers and listeners, can you share maybe a couple of examples of studies or drugs that are exciting you where you're really applying these genomic aberrations on a clinical ground right. that's affecting therapy, uh, sort right. of? Right. So we all agree with APL, right? So that's, that, that's the poster child. So what else? Well, we know that if you can identify core binding factor leukemias, which are about 10 to 20 percent of AMLs, typically more in the younger patients, um, where you have a fusion um, called the 821 translocation or the inversion 16, those patients do seem to do better with a combination of 7 and 3 with gemtuzumab azogamycin. So there's somewhere where a lot of us would feel very comfortable adding gemtuzumab to a 7 and 3 regimen. You need to get that data. Fish analysis can get it to you quickly. Um, the other place that it's really important for initial therapy is in the FLT3 space, because we now have two drugs that have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of uh, patients eligible for intensive chemotherapy with a FLT3 mutation. Um, Mitostorin, the first one based on the RATIFY trial, and now Quisartinib based on the Quantum First study. So there's an example of a genetic change in 30, 35% of AML patients, so not a significant minority um, where we are going to add in sequence with 7 and 3 a uh, FLT3 inhibitor. But we still need the 7 and 3. Ah, great you know, question. The yeah. reason I ask is because there's, you know, a lot of us and patients when they think that there's this target that is really making the leukemia kick. Yeah. Can I just get by with the target that I've No, using. no, no, you have to be careful there. I mean, let's remember that when we say we've identified a mutation, that's one of many. many. And so the median number, uh, the median number in an AML sample is like four, okay? But in older patients, it's even more than that. So you don't really know what's driving it. Now, I think the excitement that we have with menin inhibitors is because KMT2A rearrangements and NPM1 mutations, which are targets for menin inhibitors, those do seem to be drivers. On the other hand, FLT3, FLT3 mutation is a late event in leukemogenesis. So a FLT3 inhibitor that's powerful, you start that on a patient uh, with AML and a high white count, you'll see that white count come down very quickly. But you're just knocking the head off the dragon there. And so you need, if you're thinking about curative treatments for AML, you have to combine a FLT3 inhibitor with chemotherapy. And are there any, in, in your view right now, maybe taking clinical trials aside, what's the role of maintenance therapy in AML? Uh, you know, you know we, we've always been taught you do induction, then you have usually consolidation therapy of whatever you consolidate with. Yeah. After that, is there a role for maintenance? There is, uh, you know, and, and we know there is one drug approved in AML uh, for patients who've had intensive chemotherapy but do not go on to get a stem cell transplant based on the results of the Quasar trial. We know that oral azacitidine can uh, uh, cause an improvement in or lead to an improvement in relapse-free and overall survival. And the greatest benefit were in patients who were still MRD positive at the end of all that, so you're giving them something to suppress that clone as well as patients with an NPM1 mutation. So those are the two subsets of patients where we need to think about it. The trouble with maintenance therapy is the tolerability, right? You just had a patient go through six months of induction and consolidation. They've been beaten up and they're done. They want to be, be through. So, you know, you have to be careful with the maintenance therapy and know how to deal with the toxicities of some of those drugs, the GI toxicity, the myelosuppression that come along with oral azacitidine but can be managed and tend to be the worst in the first couple of cycles and then get better over time. I mean, I love the idea of using MRD for deciding on maintenance. To me, it makes a lot of sense. It's just difficult always to prove um, because I mean, variety. Thing. I, I know what your thoughts are. I mean, I, you, you think that maintenance is, should be given only to folks who are MRD positive. Um, 
or it's too soon to make that decision? Yeah, I think it's way too soon to make that decision because, you know, when we say MRD positive, what do we mean by MRD, yeah. right? It's the assay that you use. And so is a flow cytometry where, you know, you could still have quite a burden of disease below which the flow cytometer can detect? Or is it a next-gen sequencing assay um, based on um, the uh, RNA transcript like NPM1, which is much more sensitive, but still has yeah. a limit of detection. Um, so let me give you an example, okay? Um, recently, the BMT-CTN has completed a trial called uh, the MORPHO trial, where uh, they took patients with FLT3 ITD mutated AML who got an allotransplant. Now you would think, okay, they got an allotransplant, that's curative, right? potentially curative. I always tell my patients, you're going for an allotransplant first for mission, it's potentially curative. It's also potentially lethal, unfortunately. Quite a decision. So how do you, dis what can you do to help prevent that relapse? And so for FLT3 mutated um, AML, it makes sense to think about a FLT3 inhibitor. Um, uh, serafinib has been shown in two trials to actually improve relapse-free survival. But in the MORPHO trial, the interesting thing there is when they randomized patients between gilteritinib, a second generation type one inhibitor, very potent, and placebo, there was a trend for an improvement in relapse-free survival, almost met statistical significance for the whole group. But when they then applied a very, very sensitive MRD assay um, using a FLT3 ITD assay by NGS, so not your typical PCR, very sensitive, they found that they could identify patients who are MRD positive. Those were the ones who benefited from getting the FLT3 inhibitor. <coughs> the ones who were MRD negative by that assay, there was no difference in survival. Yeah. So what is, how can that help you? Well, FLT3 inhibitors are myelosuppressive. They have other toxicities. So if a patient is MRD negative using that assay, which is FDA approved, you might be able to spare them the toxicity. On the other hand, what I think we're doing in the patients who are FLT3 positive by this MRD assay, as I said, we're not curing those patients. So how does it make sense that it helps? Well, what I think we're doing there is by employing that FLT3 inhibitor early on after the transplant, you are keeping that clone under control long enough for a graft versus leukemia effect to take, yeah. take place. And then those patients can do well. Look, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, this is really amazing and fascinating. Congratulations on all the great work you're doing and you continue to do. And I'm hoping to see you at ASH. Yes, I'll be there. And in three months, we'll yep. have more progress, right? Absolutely. Things are moving quickly. Dr. Urba, everybody, here with me on the Heman Pulse.